we're happy to have you here. Happy to uh, uh, be with you. So, um, as I said, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones, and uh, I am a practicing veterinarian and a clinical herbalist, uh, also a traditional naturopath. So here's a, this is me and old Carl the herb hound. Carl actually passed away here a couple of months ago, the rotten old rascal, and uh, he didn't ask permission or anything. We went on vacation and came home and and Carl was gone, so that was sad. So he used to help me out a lot with these. This uh, particular uh, webinar was edited by his apprentice herb hound, Ozzy, uh, who's a total disaster. Uh, he just wants to chew on the keyboard, so there's probably a lot of typos in here. But uh, anyway, um, we are going to be talking about respiratory herbs. And uh, this is a good time to do it because it's uh, the summer is winding down and uh, pretty quick here. It's going to be cold and flu season. So let's talk about some of these plants. Um, before we start, I do want to just, by way of shameless commercial announcement, let you know that we are having a sale at homegrownherbalist.net right now. Uh, all the respiratory herbs are 20% off, all the formulas. Uh, so you can go to homegrownherbalist.net and uh, have a look at those. And uh, if you're really serious about being ready for, for respiratory things, uh, you might have a look at this respiratory preparedness kit. Um, that has eight formulas in it that will cover really all the bases for respiratory things. So uh, have a look at that, that respiratory preparedness kit. Um, and then you'll have what you need on hand. It kind of stinks to be sick and have to order something and three days later you get it you know so that's no good get the stuff uh get the stuff ready on hand and then you're ready to go also um we're uh yep, something bad happened there we go i'm back <laughs> also uh we're having a respiratory master's series uh, that we'll be doing one this weekend here in Buell, Idaho, uh, a plant walk focused specifically on respiratory herbs and conditions, and then a seminar afterward with a really deep discussion. Uh, so we're just kind of whetting your appetite here today, and and and, uh, and we'll be going much deeper into the anatomy and physiology and pathologies and, and herbal interactions uh, at that seminar. So if you can't come this weekend, uh, just go to homegrownherbalist.net and click on the events button, and uh, we'll be doing one probably in a town near you at some point, uh, but uh, you can see locations and dates there. So let's get going here. Let's talk a little bit about the respiratory system. Uh, lungs are pretty important. I use mine all the time, and uh, you probably do too, so let's see if we can learn how to take care of these rascals and uh, have a little bit nicer winter. So there's several herbal actions of interest. For the respiratory system and uh, we're just going to go through these one by one and uh, so you can sort of see some of the things these plants do that are beneficial to the lungs and the trachea and, and all those systems so first of all uh, we have some really good uh, herbal decongestants so uh, sinus congestion can be a real issue for some people uh, and that can lead to headaches you can get sinus headaches you can get sinus infections or sinusitis they call it um, and so it's nice to have some herbs that can break that up, you know, get that mucus moving, clear things out, relieve that pain in uh, in the sinus areas and keep you from getting infections. Um, most of those infections are just from stagnation of the of the mucus. You know, if you can keep things moving, uh, you don't usually get an infection. So uh, one of my very favorite ones for a decongestant is uh, cayenne pepper. And uh, if you don't believe me, just put a little of that in your mouth. And uh, you'll believe me right quick that that'll clear your sinuses out. Um, really a good decongestant. Uh, there's some other ones good that are also good. Uh, horseradish, of course, is good for the same reasons. It's just hot, you know, and it clears your head out. Um, but some of these others are good, too. Peppermint can be useful. Oregano, uh, thyme, um, anise seed. And uh, those can be taken um, either as a hot tea or, even better yet, Make a make that hot tea and put it in a bowl and put a towel over your head like this guy's got going and, and tent yourself and uh, and inhale that vapor, you know, and that'll help clear things up. All right, let's talk a little bit about demulcents. So demulcent herbs are herbs that contain a lot of uh, mucilage, right? And mucilage, of course, is the Greek word for plant snot, right? Mucilage is that slimy 
slippery, wonderful stuff that we find in uh, slippery elm and marshmallow and plants like that. And it's just really soothing to inflamed mucous membranes, particularly in the respiratory tract. I mean, you can use it in the digestive system. You know, if you got your guts are grumpy, you can take it. If you got a bladder infection or bladder inflammation, the demulsants will soothe that as well. But, uh, you know, for bronchi and, and windpipe irritation, sore throats are just really great, really great for soothing and calming those tissues, making them feel better. So some of the most common plants for that would be slipperium, of course. Um, and it's usually the inner bark that they're using. But, uh, you know, you can also use the seeds. And I quite like the seeds. I've got an elm tree growing right outside my front door. And, uh, man, when it's cold and flu season and I start getting a little scratchy throat or something uh, in the spring, you know, first thing, I'll go out and grab a handful of those seeds and chew them. And you can just feel that mucilage go right back and soothe that scratchy throat and make things better. And it doesn't have to be slippery on uh, slippery elm. In fact, I, I'm trying to think if I use slippery elm in anything. I don't think I do in any of my formulas. Um, and the reason is that it's kind of on the ropes as a species, you know, it's, it's kind of threatened, uh, between the Dutch elm disease and the herbalists, uh, that tree is kind of in trouble. But the good news is that any elm tree will work. You know, here in Idaho, we got these Chinese elms that, uh, everybody cusses at and is rude to. But the fact is, they're they're very good for medicine, too. Use the inner bark of those. Or again, like I said, use the seed. And of course, you got the marshmallow family. Marshmallow, mallow, hollyhock, all those guys are good. The root's better than the leaf. Um, and of course, comfrey, really a terrific, terrific source of mucilage. I mean, it's got more mucilage than any of them. Uh, and if you don't believe me, try and strain some of that tincture sometime. and <laughs> See how fun it is to get that stuff through a handkerchief. But um, comfrey is a very good demulcent, very soothing. And it's got some other good respiratory properties. We'll, we'll see that here in a minute probably too. All right, antihistamines are also useful in respiratory cases. Um, histamines, of course, are chemicals that are released by your immune system uh, in response to allergens and pathogens. And, and what they're really trying to do is drive that stuff out, right? And so your immune system gets wind of an infection and says, holy cow, let's get this guy sneezing and wheezing and bawling to flush those systems, you know, to get that stuff out of here. Um, and of course, some of the viruses take advantage of that by, you know, actually spreading uh, by making you sneeze uh, and have a runny nose and stuff. But that's what that's what the histamines are doing. They're giving you those runny nose, watery eyes, sneezing, all those head cold symptoms, you know, or, and allergy symptoms, too. And so antihistamines are good. And there are some plants that are pretty good antihistamines. Uh, my favorite one is Brigham tea. And uh, Brigham tea doesn't grow this far north in Idaho, but there's a lot of it down in central and southern Utah. Uh, it's a big plant, big shrubby, sagebrushy kind of guy. You know, they're big. Uh, at least the Nevidensis is. There's another one called uh, uh, Ephedra viridis that's a little smaller. But uh, down in southern Utah, it's a very common plant. It's a really great antihistamine. Uh, and we'll talk more in depth about some of these plants later. Uh, nettle leaf is also pretty good as an antihistamine for, for allergy symptoms. Eye bright's good. Chamomile's good. Uh, ginkgo, basil, and thyme. And there's others. But those are some good ones. And you can take those, you know, for allergy symptoms. Uh, and, you know, while we're talking about it, we ought to, somebody's probably asking, how do you take herbs, right? How do you take this stuff? Well, the answer to that's the same for all these plants, okay? The dose of a dry herb from in almost all cases is going to be a rounded teaspoon or two of the powdered herb okay of the dry powdered herb a rounded teaspoon or two for an adult a couple of three times a day all right and that'll do it so how do you take it well it doesn't matter you know put it in some juice throw it in a little water and down the hatch make a tea you know you can make a tincture you can spread it on your peanut butter sandwich put it in your smoothie it doesn't matter at all how you get the herbs into your body they'll, they'll get in there and they'll do their thing so uh, most people like a tea or a tincture um, but when I'm, when I take herbs, I usually just take the powder and throw it in a little bit of water and down the hatch, you know, but uh, I'm kind of a caveman. So that works. That works for me. Not everybody can do the textures, you know? All right. Let's talk about expectorants. So an expectorant is an herb that helps mucus get out of the lungs. Okay. Gets the goobers out of your chest. And, uh, that's the medical term actually goobers. Um, but, uh, it, the way they work is they either get the cilia moving uh, better or they make the mucus less viscous, less thick, right? More watery. Or sometimes they do both, right? 
And here's a picture, actually. This is actually a photo electron micro micrograph uh, from an electron microscope of some real cilia in a guy's real lungs, you know. So uh, those things coat the, the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles. And they're just beating all the time, moving that mucus up and out, you know, to get stuff out of your lungs. And the expectorants help them do that. And we've got some really wonderful herbal expectorants. Uh, elecampane, gumweed, cayenne is a great one. Uh, comfrey is a good expectorant. Licorice, red clover. There's a lot of them. Mullen's pretty good. Hyssop's good. Fennel. Anise seed again. You know, a lot of these plants are uh, easy to access and really, really good at getting the goobers out and really getting that mucus moving so you can cough. You know, if you've got a productive cough and you're getting stuff out, you take a little of this and you'll really get stuff out. Speaking of coughing, we get a little tired of that too sometimes, don't we? We've got a lot of herbs that are really good for coughing. Um, and they work in various ways. Uh, one of my very favorites is wild cherry bark. And wild cherry bark also has a little bit of expectorant properties, but not much. It's better mostly for a dry cough, you know, for an unproductive cough that's just aggravating you and not doing any good at all, right? So if you have a productive cough that's, that's producing a lot of mucus, uh, you probably want to take an expectorant with that, right? And, of course, if you get tired of that and you want to sleep at night, you can take some wild cherry bark, too. Um, but you don't want to shut down a productive cough. You know, that that's probably not a good idea um, unless you've got a lot of expectorants in you that are getting stuff out anyway. So um, if I'm going to use a cough suppressant for a productive cough, I'll, I'll always pair that with a good expectorant like gumweed or elecampane or one of those. So wild cherry bark, here's a picture of some wild cherry bark we harvested here, I don't know, probably years and years ago. <laughs> but it's the inner bark that you want, the cambium, right? And uh, same with the slippery elm, or the elm, any elm. Uh, if you're going to harvest the inner bark, uh, you want to peel off that outer gray bark first, and then that inner green inner bark is, is the medicine. Um, and of course, if it's a smaller twig and the Outer bark's real thin. Some of these species, the outer bark's really thin, and who cares? Leave it. You know, don't worry about it. Uh, but if you can get it off, get it off. That's great. If it, if it comes off easy, do. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Um, a lot of these plants, the bark's the medicine. Cherry bark, uh, elm, cramp bark, willow. You know, we'll talk about some of these others. But that, whenever I say the bark's the medicine, this is what I mean, this inner bark. Uh, so back to cough suppressants. Wild well, cherry bark's kind of the rock star. Mullen's really good, too. Mullen's very good. Um, mullen leaf and flower both. Uh, licorice is a good cough suppressant. Again, thyme, which is in the mint family. And fennel, also a good cough suppressant and a pretty good expectorant, as a matter of fact. And again, we'll talk about some of these in more detail. All right, antispasmodics are also really good uh, for respiratory cases. Antispasmodics are herbs that relax the muscles, and particularly the smooth muscles that are surrounding your bronchi and your bronchioles. And so if you have an asthma attack, uh, basically what's happening is the, the muscles are, are constricting and closing off your airways, right? And you get inflammation and you get mucus. So you got, you know, this sort of trifecta of three bad things. You know, you got the constriction of the airway from the muscles. You got mucus buildup because it's irritated and you got inflammation. So, you know, you now have a much narrower airway and that's that's not good. And so... One of the things you can do for that is to take an antispasmodic herb and relax those muscles and open up those airways. Um, you can also use antispasmodics for coughs. You know, sometimes if you're just coughing like crazy, an antispasmodic will calm that down too for the same reasons. It's just relaxing the muscles, right? So we have some really great antispasmodic herbs. Lobelia is a rock star, just a great plant for... for uh, Muscle spasms anywhere, but particularly for the respiratory system. Gumweed is also fabulous. Cramp bark. Uh, cramp bark's the snowball bush, right? Viburnum opulus. And again, that one's the inner bark, that, that uh, cambium layer. Black cohosh is good. Mullen is a pretty good antispasmodic. It's actually, that's how mullen works to make you quit coughing. It's a nervine is what it really is. So it's really uh, numbing your lungs. You know, it's, it's knocking the nerves out so you quit coughing. Angelica root is a good antispasmodic. And hyssop uh, is also good. Hyssop's in the mint family, too. A lot of these guys are in the mint family. And for the hyssop, it's the whole aerial part of the plant, right? When it starts to flower, you take the top third or so of it. 
Okay, let's talk about febrifuge herbs. And febrifuge, of course, is the funky herbalist word for a plant that reduces fevers. Okay, I don't use a lot of funky herbalist words. I try not to use those because uh, if you use too many of those, pretty soon, you, for some reason, you get this terrible phobia of barbers and you start wearing tie-dye and Birkenstocks and it, it's a little alarming. So uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> anyway, febrifuges are herbs that knock a fever out. They turn it off. Okay. Um, usually they do this in in chemically very much the way aspirin does. Uh, and there's also some diaphoretic herbs, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but uh, those those will break fevers too, but in a different way. They actually make the fever work better. Okay, so if you take, uh, for example, willow bark, which is aspirin on a stick for all intents and purposes. It's got salicylic acid in it like aspirin has. Uh, if you take that, you're shutting the fever off. Well, maybe that's a good idea and maybe it's not, right? Because the fever is actually doing something. Your body's generating that fever to make it harder for the bacteria and the viruses to do their thing. It's, it's, it's a battle. And the fever is one of the weapons that our body has. And so, you know, for the most part, unless you're just miserable, uh, I don't really think breaking a fever is all that useful or valuable. Even in little kids, you know, the, the ERs and the doctors and the urgent cares are starting to come around and say, oh, look, lady, it's, he's got a fever. Take him home and let it do what it's doing. You know, they're, they're getting tired of treating fevers, too. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes if you're just miserable and tired of it, you know, go ahead and do something about it. But uh, remember that the fever is trying to do something beneficial. So what are some of these herbs? Well, spirea is a good one. And uh, spirea is also called meadowsweet. They usually call it spirea in the trade. In the nurseries, they call it spirea. You can go buy a spirea bush. It's a very common ornamental. Uh, and the word aspirin, in fact, is aspirea, out of spirea. That's where aspirin came from uh, originally. So spirea, the leaves and the twigs and the flowers, anything bendy and soft is medicine. And uh, it's basically aspirin. It's salicylic acid. So you'd use it like aspirin. Uh, willow bark, same thing, the inner bark. Not the brown, gnarly tree trunk bark, but the soft green bark on the twigs. Uh, poplar, birch. Aspen, cottonwood, all those guys, they're all cousins. And they all have salicin or populin, which are chemicals that are very similar to aspirin. So you can use them for fever, inflammation, pain, anything you could use aspirin for, you can use those plants for. And then, of course, you got the diaphoretic herbs. And the diaphoretic herbs work very differently to break a fever. So instead of shutting it down, like, like the aspirin does, like the spirea does, what a diaphoretic does is it actually enhances and accentuates the fever briefly. So it can do its job faster and better. And then, you know, it breaks of its own accord once it's done its job. So you take a cup of hot yarrow tea and wrap up in a blanket and you'll break into a sweat, you know, a diaphoresis, they call it, you know, causing uh, perspiration. And that and it'll actually increase your fever a little bit and and break it in a natural good way. Uh, and so it's helping the fever kill the bugs instead of shutting it off. You know, shutting your fever off is kind of like fighting for the other team, right? So the diaphoretics are kind of better in that way. Um, and people always ask me, well, how high a fever would you do that with? And you know what? I don't care. I, I just would do it. I don't think uh, the chances of increasing your fever high enough to, to hurt yourself are just so minimal. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, like I say, the whole fever thing, you know, unless you're 106 or 107 and your brain's melting anyway, I don't think these are going to hurt you. Um but uh, yarrow is a good diaphoretic. Calendula, basil, bone sit's pretty good. And again, hyssop and rosemary. Rosemary is quite good. Same thing. You take a hot tea. Diaphoretics tend to work better if they're hot. So make a hot tea, bundle up in a blanket, drink your tea, and, uh, and you're off to the races. All right, something else we can do for, uh, for herbal interactions, interventions with the, with the respiratory system is we can use immune stimulating herbs, right? And those can be very helpful for fighting bacterial infections or viral infections. Um, so let's talk about some of those. So some really good ones are uh, echinacea is quite good. Black-eyed Susan is good. And black-eyed Susan and echinacea are cousins. Uh, they used to be in the same genus, but but now the echinacea is echinacea and the black-eyed Susan's rudbeckia. But they're, you know, they're identical medicinally. Uh, the black-eyed Susan is actually a titch better because it has a slightly warmer energy. If you're going to take echinacea, 
I always tell people to take something stimulating with it, you know, a little ginger, or a peppermint, or a little pinch of cayenne, something sort of zingy, because echinacea is a very mild herb. If you're going to take echinacea, you should probably take twice as much as I told you before. You should probably take, an, instead of one to two teaspoons, you should probably take two to four, and you should probably be doing that three or four times a day. It's a very mild herb, and take something with it that's zingy. It's it's sort of, you know, it's sort of like the lady that goes to the dance the you know the church party and nobody knows she's there the quiet sweet introverted lady and nobody knows she's there unless her husband's there with her her obnoxious husband right <laughs> that's echinacea so you gotta you gotta bring the obnoxious husband to the party the peppermint or the ginger or the cayenne so anybody notices the echinacea and then it'll work better uh, that's not as critical with the black eyed susan it's got a little bit warmer energy um, olive leaf another really good immune stimulant astragalus of course is great uh, garlic is very good and some of these plants also have direct antiviral properties, too. Garlic does, astragalus does. Um, Pate Arco is a good immune stimulant. Got some antiviral properties, too. Ginseng stimulates everything. That's an overall tonic. Uh, but it's a good uh, a good immune stimulant. And then Lonacera, which is uh, Japanese honeysuckle. The flower is the medicine. And that's a really good immune stimulant, especially for respiratory stuff. So if you've got some Japanese honeysuckle growing, Pick those little flowers and make a tea or a tincture or just eat them. And uh, that's a good uh, cold and flu preventative and, and fighter. They're pretty, too, those little Japanese honeysuckles. They'll grow. I've got them growing here in Idaho. Uh, you know, just speaking of that, a place you can buy some plants, if you're wanting to buy plants, um, there's a website called companionplants.com. Uh, Pete, back in Ohio, great guy, great plants. I've bought a lot of stuff from him over the years. Um and then there's another one, uh, strictlymedicinalseeds.com. They've got some seeds for plants, and they've got plants too. And we've got plants from them too. So we've we've uh, we've bought a lot of plants from those two outfits and been happy with them. All right, uh, there are also herbs that are specifically antiviral. Some herbs actually kill the virus, or or prevent it. I don't know, kill the virus. Viruses aren't actually alive. They're not living things, so I don't know if you really kill a virus. But you can kill the cell that the virus is in, okay? That's <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, the other thing they do is a lot of them prevent the virus from attaching to the cell membrane, so they can't uh, get into the cell. See, the, the way a, a, a virus works, a virus is just a little piece of genetic code, you know, a little piece of DNA or RNA, and it injects that code into the cell, and the cell incorporates the new DNA into its regular DNA. And so the guys roll the blueprints out and say, oh, well, you know, we're not making insulin today. We're making influenza viruses or, you know, we're not going to make mucus. We're not going to make whatever we usually make. We're going to make virus particles. And they and they and that's what they do. They produce viruses. And so it's sort of uh, the virus sort of co-ops the reproductive and, and manufacturing properties of the cell to, to reproduce itself. Uh, they have no power to reproduce on their own. And so... Uh, Anyway, they have to attach to the cell and inject that DNA, and the, some of these herbs stop them from doing that. Some of them uh, interfere with replication once it's in there. Some of them, you know, stimulate the immune system to kill them more effectively. They, you know, a lot of these antivirals have several modes of action, and so uh, they're handy to have too. And there's some really good herbs for this, uh, particularly for respiratory viruses, and all these herbs here have activity against respiratory viruses, particularly influenza. So elder is a great one, and we'll talk about elder a little bit more later. Uh, Lomatium is also really good. Garlic is good. You know, some of these were good as anti, uh, as immune stimulants also, you know, but some of them have direct antiviral activity. Ginseng does, St. John's wort does, hyssop does, and then sink foil, yarrow, you know, calendula. There's a lot of them that are antiviral. And, uh, you know, the sink foil has also got good activity against uh, respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, the little kids get. Sink foil. Sink foil is potentilla, right? The little yellow, it's in the rose family. And uh, and it makes little yellow flowers, little white flowers. Go to a La Quinta Inn anywhere in North America, you'll find potentilla. So <laughs> I don't know if you can harvest it there, but you can find it there. Um, anyway, it's a very common ornamental. Um, oh, my thing went away. There, it's back. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's take a couple of minutes here for an intermission. 
And uh, if you need to run and do something for a second, you can. And when we get back, we're going to talk about my 10 favorite respiratory herbs. That's right. And uh, there's actually more than 10 of them because anybody that spent any time with me at all realizes that I, I am numerically challenged. Uh, and uh, there are three kinds of people in the world. There's the ones that can count and the ones that can't. So I think there's actually 12. But anyway, we'll come back and talk a little deeper about those uh, those plants. And uh, and then afterward, we'll have a little question and answer, and you can ask me whatever you want. So that'll be fun. So we'll be back in about five minutes, Dr. Patrick Jones, and we'll talk about those 10 favorite plants when I get back. <laughs> All right, we're back. Maybe you never left. I don't know. I, I actually ran back to the herb room and and uh, got some herbs, speaking of the respiratory system. I'm a little hoarse tonight. Uh, I did a webinar last weekend and talked to myself hoarse. And and uh, and then I ate a fast food hamburger, which uh, was a really bad idea, and I burned the heck out of my throat getting rid of that later in the evening. So <laughs> I, I've been hoarse all week. But anyway, I've got... Uh, we were talking about taking herbs. I've got some uh, marshmallow, uh, licorice, and peppermint in here to see if I can keep talking for another half hour. That's quite yummy and makes your throat feel better. Okay. And, uh, you know, I just threw the powder in the water. That's how I take them. So uh, that's how you can do it, too. So let's talk about it. <clears throat> let's talk about 10 of my very favorite respiratory herbs, uh, 10 or so, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, Brigham tea. We've mentioned some of these. Let's get a little deeper. Brigham tea is ephedra. There's two species that are common, at least where I hunt for the stuff. One is uh, ephedra viridis, and the other is ephedra nevidensis, and there's several other species, and who cares which one's which? They all work the same. Uh, the green... Uh, the green twiggy stuff is what you want. These are old ancient plants. All their cousins are dinosaurs. They think this whole mammal thing is just a flash in the pan. Uh, they've been around for a long time. All their cousins are fossils. Been around forever. Um, and uh, they're great big down south in southern Utah. They're big shrubby plants. And they have a lot of really good antihistamine properties. And that's what most people use them for. And so you can use them for all those histamine symptoms we talked about with head colds, you know, runny noses, watery eyes, scratchy throats, all that stuff. And and for allergies too, you know, any of those histamine related things, anything you'd take an antihistamine to fix, you can use Brigham tea instead. And it's very effective. Um, I also use it uh, on asthma cases. A lot of asthma cases are exacerbated by allergies and histamines. And so we throw a little of that. We have a formula called uh, respiratory asthma, A-Z-M-A, uh, that you might have a peek at if you're interested. Uh, did I mention all the formulas are 20% off this week, all the respiratory formulas? So swing by homegrownherbalist.net and buy something. That's fun. It makes me feel happy inside. And when I feel happy inside, I do webinars and stuff. So that's good, right? So go <laughs> go pick something up and see if we can keep the lights on here. Um, Brigham tea is also mildly stimulating, sort of a get you past 3 in the afternoon without a Mountain Dew kind of an effect. Very nice. Um, not jarring like caffeine, but just wakes you up and helps you do better. Um, a lot of minerals in it, too. A lot of calcium. Uh, I use it a lot on elderly folks or convalescent, chronically ill people. You know, it's got a lot of nutrients that are good. But uh, anyway, really great. It's kind of a slow grower, so don't get too aggressive with the harvesting. Um, but there's usually a lot of it where you find it, a lot of plants. So just take what you need. And it's the green twiggy things. I don't even know what they are. They're not leaves. They're not branches. They're little twigs. That's what you want. All right. Cayenne, capsicum annuum. Uh, this is another really super effective herb for respiratory stuff. Uh, really good for warding off colds, uh, breaking up mucus. It's a good expectorant, really a good expectorant. Um, it's also really good for clearing the sinuses, as we've mentioned. Uh and if you have a sore throat, you can put cayenne in a little water and and drink that and keep it in there as long as you can stand it and swallow it. And if you survive that experience, it'll nine times out of ten knock that sore throat out. You know, <laughs> it burns like crazy, but it will kill the bugs. 
so it's pretty good. I don't know if it's antibiotic or if it's just scaring the heck out of those rascals. But anyway, it's doing something and very effective. Um, if you're going to use cayenne for the respiratory effects, don't put it in a capsule, right? You got to you got to man up and take it. Put it in your mouth and get the job done. And any hot pepper will work. It doesn't have to be cayenne specifically. Uh, the heat is the medicine. So, uh, but we like cayenne. Cayenne's a good one. They're easy to grow. Go to the nursery and buy some and just grow them like peppers. They're, you know, when they're red and ready to go, you dry them and use them. All right, elder. This is another great one. Sambucus is the genus. Uh, I usually use Sambucus nigra, uh, which is not the one in the picture here. This is the wild elder that we have um, here locally in Idaho and Utah. Um, but it's a pretty common plant. You get to a certain elevation, there's a lot of elder. Uh, and it'll grow anywhere. You know, you can bring it down where you live. It doesn't have to be that elevation to grow. But in the wild, it's usually kind of up in the hills. Um, really a tremendous herb for colds and flus. And, uh, you know, when I'm coming down with something, I'll go out into the yard. And this, you know, I'll grab a handful of elder leaf, handful of peppermint, handful of yarrow, make a tea, equal parts. And you, if you drink that all day, nine times out of ten, you won't catch whatever you think you were going to catch. Uh, really great antiviral properties for the influenza virus uh, and also for the rhinoviruses that cause head colds. So it's good for both of those. Um, it's also uh, got some demulcent soothing properties for sore throats and your irritated bronchi. It's got some expectorant properties too. So it's it's really good. It's, it's also good for sinus inflammation. So elder is a great plant. Uh, the leaf, the berry, and the flower are all medicinal and in that order of strength. The leaf is the strongest and then the berry and then the flower. I use the leaf all the time. I mean, I've been using the leaf for decades in thousands of people. I've never had so much as a bellyache complaint. Uh, so, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I read in a book that elder leaf will kill you. And, well, you know, it hasn't been my experience. All these plants have a little cyanide in them and cyanide's actually not medicinal. But, I mean, your cherries and apricots and peaches have a little cyanide too, so don't be scared. Uh, the leaf in adults seems to be fine. Um, the berry, of course, is good for anybody. And if it's a little tiny person, like smaller than a toddler, I'll use the flower. That's the weakest one. Okay. But if it's a toddler or anything bigger than that, I'll give them the berry. And if it's an old adult, I'll give them the leaf. If it's not an adult and you give them the leaf, you might give them a bellyache. Uh, but there you go. There is one species of elder, uh, Sambucus racemosa, red elder. And the berries on the red elder are red. And those ones are pretty toxic. I mean, they won't kill you, but they'll give you a bellyache, and, and you'll wish you'd listen to Doc Jones and not ate them. Uh, but the other elders, if the berry is blue or purpley blue, uh, those are great. All right, here's another favorite of mine. This is gumweed. Uh, if I only had five plants, this would be one of those, one of those 87 plants I'd have. Uh, Grindelia is what they call it in the trade, usually. Here in Idaho, we call it gumweed because we've touched it before. We know it's sticky. Um, but uh, it grows just about anywhere. It, it likes really crummy dirt, really gravelly, dry, disturbed dirt is where it's usually found. Um, but uh, the flowers, the medicine, the buds too. So when it starts flowering, like I mean it, I'll, I'll harvest flowers and buds. The leaf's medicinal too, but it's nowhere near as good. I wouldn't waste my time with the leaves. Um, really a phenomenal expectorant. I mean, a rock star, super duper good expectorant. Um, and it's also a really good antispasmodic, it's muscle relaxant, right? So it's really great for asthma cases because you're opening up the lungs, you know, opening up the bronchi by relaxing those muscles and you're getting the goobers out. And what else do you want, right? That's good asthma medicine. Um, it's also a good antibiotic. So if you got bronchitis, you know, there you go. Um, really a good plant it also uh accelerates healing you know so your your bronchi and your trachea get all tore up and wore out from coughing and coughing and coughing and the grandelia goes in there just like comfrey and heals stuff up so it's really a great plant flowers the medicine mullen verbascum thapsus which is fun to say verbascum thapsus uh, really a good plant for uh sore throats for irritated bronchi for coughs that's what most people take it for um the leaf or the flower. The flower is actually better, uh, but the flower is kind of a pain in the neck to harvest. So most people use the leaf, which is plenty good. Um, it's got some mild expectorant properties, uh, but uh, what it does is it actually 
numbs the nerves, you know, uh, of your bronchi. So they quit coughing. It kind of tells everybody to have a nap and lay off for a while. So that's nice if you're coughing too much. And it's got some expectorant properties to pull the goobers up. Um, it's uh, it's also good for worms for the same reasons, right? <laughs> Knocks them out, breaks up the mucus in your guts. So they fall asleep and they wake up somewhere else and they're very confused. So it's a good wormer. Um, you can also smoke it. You can roll it up and, and uh, make yourself a little mullen cigar. And that'll get those chemicals into your lungs to stop that cough. Or just make a smudge and breathe it like incense, you know, if you don't want to scare your neighbors. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a really safe plant, um, you know, unless you're allergic to it, which a few people are, but not much. Uh, mullen leaf or, or flower. Here's another really great antispasmodic, Lobelia. And there's two species here. The blue one is the one mostly that we use, Lobelia inflata. And then, of course, the red one is Lobelia cardinalis. They call that cardinal flower. Sometimes you see that one in nurseries. The little Lobelia that you see in nurseries and flower shops, the little Lobelia that's in all the hanging baskets and stuff, that's a different species. That's Lobelia arinus, usually, which is an African species uh, and and is different. It's medicinal, but it's different than these guys. So they, you don't want that one for respiratory stuff. Um, if I remember right, it's an anti-cancer, but I, I don't remember. I don't use it. Uh, but uh, the Lobelia inflata and the Lobelia cardinalis are both very, very good antispasmodics and expectorants. They're also good expectorants. So a really great asthma herb, a really great cough herb, um, or anywhere else you got muscle spasms. You know, if you got a rib out of joint and you're getting back spasms, or if you got, you know, whatever kind of cramping or muscle cramping or spasms, the, the Lobelia will fix it. Um, but we use it a lot for asthma cases. Uh, I use it a lot for cat asthma, feline asthma. In the vet practice, we give them about a tenth of a cc of the tincture. And you got to get that all the way in the back of their throat or they'll be really mad and spit and fuss and foam about it. But otherwise, it works pretty good. Um, <laughs> it's hard to get herbs into cats. Uh, the inflata is stronger than the, than the cardinalis. Um, but otherwise, they're both very good. The plant's the medicine, the whole upper plant. Wait till it flowers and then harvest it. Wild cherry bark, this is choke cherry, is what we call it out here in the western U.S. is choke cherry. Uh, the inner bark is the is the medicine and uh, the cambium, right? And uh, I would recommend harvesting that after it fruits. Because, again, this is a stone fruit. They're going to have a little cyanide in it. And after they make the fruit, they put that cyanide into the seed, into the pit, right? Um, but... Uh, so if you harvest the bark before it fruits, you know, you might get a bellyache. It's not like it's going to kill you, you know, but you'll get a bellyache. So just, just harvest it after it fruits. We usually harvest this in the fall is the best time to harvest it, um, late summer, early fall. But uh, it's a really good, really good anti-cough uh, suppressant. Uh, it's got some antispasmodic effects too, but it's really a great cough suppressant. A little bit of an expectorant property there, but not great. But for cough, really great. All right, here's another one, Lomatium. And Lomatium, they call it biscuit root out here. I don't know what they call it where you live, but uh, we call it biscuit root or desert parsley, some people call it. Um, it's in the, the parsley family, you know, with, with all those guys. Um, and there are some plants in this family that'll kill you. Um, but those ones usually have white flowers, not yellow flowers, and they have a little bit of a different growth habit and a different leaf. But be real careful, okay? If you don't know what Lomatium is, don't go harvest it by yourself. Take somebody with you that knows what they're doing. It has some really powerful antiviral properties, particularly against the respiratory viruses, the influenzas. Um, but it also has some really powerful properties against, you know, fungal infections and bacterial infections and even tuberculosis, the mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes tuberculosis. Uh, the Lomatium is good for that. Um, there, you know, it's funny. I was doing a plant walk here last week. And, and three people, actually it was the Respiratory Master Seminar. We were in the Respiratory Master Seminar talking about it. And three different people had a story about Native Americans that had used the Lomatium to survive the Spanish flu outbreak, like like zero cases of flu, because they were using the Lomatium. Three different tribes. 
So that's that's something they've been using forever, and, and we'd probably be smart to do it too. Um, some people will get a, a little bit of a rash from taking this. Um, they call it the Lomatium rash. So <laughs> whenever something has a name, it means it probably happens often enough that people have noticed. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's itchy like crazy, uh, but it's not super common. And if you get it, uh, if you immediately stop taking uh, the Lomatium, that rash will be gone in, in about seven days. If you continue taking the Lomatium, it'll, it'll be like a week, you know, before that rash is gone. So, uh, you know, you can do it either way. But uh, anyway, um, the root is the medicine, and uh, it's a really good plant. It combines really well, by the way, with balsam root, which we'll talk about in a minute. But really a neat plant. Ella Campaign, this is another one. This one's grown in my, these pictures are from my garden. Uh, in fact, several of these pictures are from my garden. But anyway, really, really a good expectorant. Really a good expectorant. Um, and uh, the roots, the medicine, harvest them in the fall. They'll be stronger in the fall. Uh, this plant also has a lot of inulin in it. In fact, inulin uh, was named for this plant. The genus of this plant's inula. Inula helenium is the name. But uh, inulin is a, a non-soluble fiber that mammals can't digest but the bacteria in our guts love it and it's so it's a really great prebiotic for supporting your your normal gut microflora uh, so it's good for that but it's really good for moving mucus and again uh it's a good wormer for the same reason because it moves the mucus in your intestine and gets rid of those worms so good plant don't take that one if you're pregnant yarrow this is another really good plant um, it's got some really important medicinal applications for respiratory stuff. Uh, it's a really good diaphoretic. That's what most people use it for in respiratory cases. Um, so it'll induce that sweat and break the fever. Uh, the upper part of the plant's the medicine. So when it starts to flower, I'll harvest like the top quarter or so, leaf and flower. They're all good. Um, the native ones are white, like, like in the picture here. But, you know, you can go to the nursery and buy red ones and yellow ones and pink ones, and they all seem to work. We've got them all grown on our place, and I use them all interchangeably. They, they all seem fine. Um, good one to have around. This has also got some antiviral properties and some anti-inflammatory properties. It's a really good plant. And, of course, it's great for bleeding. That's what most people know it for, is for bleeding uh, internally or topically. But, but for respiratory stuff, it's got good antibiotic and antiviral properties. It's got some anti-inflammatory properties, um, and it's got some diaphoretic, you know, fever-breaking properties. So really good. Don't take it if you're pregnant. Okay, I'm just going to do one more. All right, one more favorite, uh, and this plant, I have no idea what it does. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how it works. It's Romania, Romania glutinosa. The roots, the medicine. And uh, it looks like the foxglove, the digitalis in your garden, but it's not. Don't take that stuff. That's uh, that's not what you want for this. Um, but uh, it just there's something about Romania root that just makes you feel better. You know, when you when you're sick and you just feel awful and everything hurts and you you got that malaise, that weak, miserable. I'm sick and I'm gonna lay on the couch and pout. Thing men get that, women don't get that. But uh, <laughs> anyway. The Romania fixes that. The Romania, the Romania makes you feel good enough to go to work and get all your coworkers sick. You know, it's a really great plant. Uh, so from a marketing standpoint, they ought to put that in the NyQuil too. But anyway, um, <laughs> really wonderful for just making you feel better. It's got other properties too um, that are really great. But that's what I take it for with respiratory things is just to, to get over that, that malaise, right, that feeling miserable. And it tastes good. So what could be bad? Okay, this is the last one, I promise. And I, I just included this one because it's it might be my favorite plant in the whole world. I just love this plant. Um, and this is uh, arrow leaf balsam root. Okay, and it grows uh, all over the Great Basin, all over the western United States, uh, usually on an incline, usually on a hill, and usually in the graveliest, driest, most miserable dirt you can find. So it's hard to harvest. You know, the dirt's really hard, compact, rocky dirt where it grows, and it's on a hill. And uh, it's uh, it's a lot of work to get those roots up. And the roots are big, heavy. There's a picture of the roots here. But it's like a tree. It's like somebody buried a palm tree, and just the leaves are coming out the top of the dirt, you know. 
the roots have a heavy, heavy bark on them. We actually process this with a bandsaw. You know, we cut it into really narrow, you know, little hockey pucks. And then we tincture those for about two weeks. And then we uh, take them out and bust them up in the blender and tincture them for another two weeks. Because <laughs> it's so woody. You know, you really can't powder it. But uh, medicinally, it's very like ex echinacea. But it's very much better. You know, so it's an immune stimulant. It's got some antiviral and antibacterial properties. But it's also um, really got a warm energy. You know, so it's... it's uh, Michael Moore, who is a great herbalist, uh, said that that balsam root is like echinacea plus osha, you know. So it's got that warming, immune stimulating, energizing, great properties. It's also a pretty good expectorant. Um, so uh, the roots, the medicine, really hard to dig up, unfortunately, and hard to process. But man, it's good stuff. Uh, don't take it if you're pregnant. But uh, arrow leaf balsam root, just to look at it, it's the most beautiful thing. You know, you, around the end of May, you drive through the canyons in this country, and that stuff's just blooming its brains out, and just beautiful. The leaves are shaped like arrows, and it's sort of a dusty gray. There's some other plants around here that look like it. Um, there's one called mule's ear that has a big yellow flower like that, but the ear, but the leaf is shaped like a donkey ear, right? It's not shaped like an arrowhead. So, anyway, really a wonderful plant. All right. Well, thanks for listening. Um, and uh, just to remind you, we do have those respiratory preparedness kits. We're going to do a Q&A here. So if you've got questions, uh, type them into that chat box and we'll answer them. Uh, we've got the respiratory preparedness kits on the website, homegrownherbalist.net. And there's, like I said, eight formulas that I've developed. A lot of these are made with stuff we've grown ourselves right here. And they're fantastic for whatever is ailing you in a respiratory way. Uh, if you've got this kit, you're you're ready to hit the ground running come cold and flu season in a couple of weeks here. Um, also, we'd love to have you join us. If you, if you enjoyed this and you want to get deeper and really learn some stuff, come to one of those respiratory master seminars and, and plant walks. Uh, like I said, we're having one this weekend here in Buell. And uh, we'll be doing them, you know, all over the western states uh, and in other places. And, of course, they're on the school. If you're in the Homegrown Herbalist School, those things are recorded and and uh and available there always too so anything we do always gets put into the school as well so speaking of the school uh, we are doing a special right now hundred dollars off use the discount code webinar and i'll give you a hundred bucks just because i like you and you can bring a study buddy for free so that is a ridiculously screaming deal uh, our goal here is to make a lot of herbalists so that i can work myself out of a job and retire that's <laughs> That's my sinister plan and why I'm giving you such a good deal on the school. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in the school, go to homegrownherbalist.net and uh, we will get you squared away. So, we're going to do the q and I'm going to have to have Evan come in here. He's my IT genius guy and my kid, both. And he's going to have to come change screens so I can look and see what the questions are. And then we will uh, get going on some questions. Anyway, in the meantime, if you have a question, raise your hand, right? So. <laughs> anyway, we'll get that figured out. Um, so, like I said, we are having that Respiratory Master Series here in Buell. You know, if you haven't ever come, if you live in the western United States, Come to one of those plant walks at my place because you can see how we're growing things. We're growing about 150 species of medicinal plants. And you can see how we're processing it and how we're making the medicine and the whole the whole show. Uh, that's that's worth doing. And you'll see things you can grow you didn't know you could grow, you know, because we're growing them. And you can say, well, heck, if Doc can grow them, maybe I can grow them too. Uh, and then uh, the other thing is that uh, we do that that master seminar. You know, so we really get deep. We talk about the anatomy and the physiology and all that stuff. So Evan's got my thing going here. I'm going to put on my glasses. And then uh, and then uh, we will get some questions answered here. All right. You want to give me a... Oh, I'm using the wrong mouse. All right. All right, 
Linda Sprague wants to know if this lesson is the same as next Saturday's master class in Buell. No, it isn't. The one in Buell is going to be much deeper and bigger and complicated. Or uh, we'll be talking about a lot of things in a lot more depth uh, at that meeting. Uh, this is just sort of a a little tasty teaser. Uh, but uh, the one the one in Buell will be much more involved. Um, okay. Everyone says the music was still on early on. I guess we fixed that. Okay. Let me see here. All right. The young man in the background is Evan, my son. He's the IT genius that runs the whole show here. Um, we're sure happy to have him. Um Okay, so uh, Tranquil Waves wants to know, after quitting smoking, is there anything that will open up the tiny air spaces again? Um, you know, the lungs over time really can clean themselves out. Um, you know, all that tar and gook and goobers that gets in there from smoking can be, uh, a lot of that can clean out. I would certainly get some mullen going and and uh, some elecampane or gum weed to help that process along. Um, but yeah, that can that can turn around. Homesteading at Cooker's Gearheft says that she's been battling sinus stuff for a week. That's no fun. Get some uh, horseradish or some cayenne and get that stuff cleaned out. That'll straighten you up. Uh, Goldenrod, Jake says. Oh, Goldenrod's a great one. We should have talked about Goldenrod. Goldenrod's a very good uh, expectorant, and it has some antihistamine properties. Um, really good for bronchitis and things like that. That's right. Goldenrod's also a specific for candida and yeast infections. So uh, that's a great plant. And by the way, the goldenrod does not make people sneeze. That is not true. Uh, the pollen on that plant is actually way too big to get in your anywhere that could make you sneeze. Uh, it looks like ragweed, so everybody's grumpy to it. But the goldenrod is not an allergic, allergy-causing plant. Okay. Uh, Laura Bergeson wants to know, is Brigham, safe, Brigham tea safe for long-term use? Absolutely. That is an overall body tonic, great nutritive, uh, great pick-me-up. You can use that all the time. Um, so that's good. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Stacy wants to know, is it better to make tinctures from fresh plants or dried plants? Um, you know, it, I make almost everything from dried plants, but that's more from a convenience standpoint. One of the risks of using fresh plants is that the plants sometimes have a lot of water content, and so you'll get uh, dilution of the alcohol, and if it's too much water, uh, you may find that it's actually, you know, the alcohol is not strong enough to be a good preservative. So I use dry plants mostly. There's a few exceptions to that. I do uh, uh, shepherd's purse. I do fresh. Um, I've recently been hearing and learning that echinacea is way better if you do it fresh. But I use Everclear for both of those, not not vodka. Uh, Everclear is a, a, a brand of alcohol. It's about twice as strong as vodka. So so if you got water in there, it won't dilute it enough. You, you're basically making vodka if you cut Everclear in half with water. So... Uh, all right. Let's see if I can scroll down here and get some more questions. Okay, Donna wants to know if there's any help for damaged alveoli. The alveoli, of course, are the uh, little air sacs at the very, very end of your of your bronchial system. And unfortunately, if they get damaged, uh, there's not a lot you can do about that as far as restoring those. Um, a lot of times people get, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and emphysema and things like that. And there really isn't a, an herb that'll fix those. The elasticity goes away and they get scar tissue and then you're just done. Um, and there are things you can do to help, you know, compensate for that. I mean, you can take, uh, expectorant herbs and, and bronchodilators and muscle relaxants and things to clear the lungs and open the airways as much as possible, your antispasmodic herbs and stuff. 
uh, things like gumweed or lobelia or you know elecampane for an expectorant. Um, but as far as actually fixing the uh, the alveoli, that's probably not going to happen. Um, will we be able to get the slides? Carol wants to know. You bet, Carol. Nice lady like you. Why not? Send me an email and put uh, put PDF in the subject line, okay? And we'll send you the slides for this. And then you'll have me print them up and stick them in your notebook for your, the apocalypse or whatever. That'll be fun. Also, of course, if you're enrolled in the school, you'll have access to this uh, material forever, too. Um, let's see. Dorothea wants to know if Russian olive qualifies as olive leaf. Nope. Different critter. It is medicinal. And if I thought really hard, I could remember what it did, but I can't. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, that's actually an, uh, a newcomer to North America. It actually started out in Iran, if I remember right. Um, but it does have some additional properties. I can't remember what it is. Is it an anti-rheumatic? I can't remember. I don't know. Look it up. But no, it's not olive leaf. Different, different genus. Um, if an asthma attack begins, Janine asks, what would you recommend for a protocol herbally? Uh, I like lobelia for asthma or gumweed. Either of those. I have a lot of clients, uh, asthmatic clients, that have that are no longer using uh, inhalers and pharmaceuticals for their asthma. They're just using lobelia, and some of them are using it as needed, and some of them are using it, you know, twice a day as a preventative, prophylactic kind of thing. Uh, but that's very effective. Lobelia and gumweed both are very effective for asthma. Cramp bark's pretty good too, um, but lobelia and and uh, gumweed are also both expectorants. So that's that's good. You're opening things up and getting goobers out, so that's always good. Um, and then I throw a little titch of Brigham tea in there too to op to clear things from a histamine standpoint when I'm doing asthma, but uh, not me personally, but when I'm treating people. Um, John Christopher's treatment for asthma was he would uh, he would go in and he'd get a big pot of peppermint tea and brew it up and fill the person up with tea. And then he would start ladling lobelia tincture into him a teaspoon at a time. And then uh, he'd go around looking for trash cans and buckets and pots for him to throw up in. And uh, <laughs> the common name for lobelia is pukeweed. Uh, and he figured that about the time they started puking was where he wanted them on a really bad asthma attack. But I haven't found that to be necessary. Um, you, can, uh, you can give less and not make them puke and they still get uh, straightened out from the asthma. Okay. Chris Marcus says, I've had very good dealings with strictly medicinal. I have too. We've had good luck. Um, uh, Chris also says, on a lighter note, garlic is good for keeping vampire bats away, which is true. Uh, we actually had a rabid bat here in Twin Falls, Idaho lately, so everyone's all excited about rabies, but uh, don't kiss the bats. That's the take-home message there. Um, Linda wants to know the two plant websites I said again. Yeah, we'll put them in the description okay um and when i say we i mean evan because i have no idea how to do that but <laughs> it's uh companionplants.com and strictly medicinal seeds.com those are both those are the guys i buy plants from and you can buy seeds from them too um elizabeth wants to know if there's any help for a chronic cough like long term sounds like 50 years Seems like I've had a lot of mucus and I cough sporadically. Um, you know, I would I would uh, get after some of those uh, cough suppressant and expectorant formulas. Uh, we have two. We have a, a whole series of respiratory formulas on homegrownherbalist.net. Uh, one's an expectorant, one's for coughs. You know, we've got a histamine formula. We got everything, um, and they're all in that eight tincture respiratory preparedness kit. But uh, I certainly, you know. Some some mullen would probably do you a lot of good. Some some uh, gumweed would probably do you a lot of good. Um, Laura wants to know, will you please do a plant walk and seminar in southern Utah? Yes, Laura, I will do that just for you. Um, we'll come down to St. George and do that. Okay, I, I I need to get down there. I've got a lot of students down there, and last time I was there was four or five years ago. So we'll go putter around and commune with the Brigham tea. How about that? All right, I'll, I'll schedule that here. We'll probably come down in September. I usually like to go to St. George in August because it's 120 degrees. But uh, 
we'll we'll try September and see if it's as good. Um, all right. Um, Debbie wants to know if garlic is still medicinal if it's canned. Probably not. If you cook it, you kill it. Uh, it's got to be fresh, or you can dry it and powder it. But if you cook it, uh, it's no good. So that's not good. Um, all right, let me see if I can get some more of these. Anatolian wants to know, oh, Anatolian gal wants to know, what do you use for pneumonia? So pneumonia is uh, a deep lung infection, a lot of fluid in there. Um, and again, we're going to use the same plants. Uh, I'd probably get real aggressive with uh, with some expectorants on that one. Um, and you have to be a little careful. I'll tell you something we didn't talk about in this little webinar, but we'll talk about in depth at, this, at the seminar is managing cytokines during a pneumonia situation. Uh, cytokines are immune uh, system chemicals that can actually produce more fluid. And uh, there's some things you can do for that to keep from drowning in your own immune response. Uh, grape leaf is a good plant for that. But uh, um, And we'll talk about that again in a second. It looks like somebody else is asking about that. Well, we'll just talk about it now. Lara wants to know, how do you know if you're having a cytokine storm? So a cytokine storm is... is when that happens, you know, the cytokines are immune chemicals and they're, uh, you know, your immune system's releasing cytokines to draw immune response. You know, they're calling the neutrophils and the white blood cells in there to kill stuff. Um, sometimes you can have too much of a good thing and that's what they call a cytokine storm. And so you get actually fluid and, and uh, that's what happened with the Spanish flu. The guys that were dying were the young, healthy guys and they were actually drowning in their own, their own immune response. So, uh, that's how you tell. If you start getting a lot of fluid, if you start really, you know, feeling wet in your lungs, uh, that's probably cytokines. And you need to start laying off the herbs that stimulate cytokines and and getting on the herbs that stop them. And uh, we're, like I said, we'll get a lot deeper into that uh, during that respiratory master seminar. Um, but grape leaf is a good one for shutting that down. Um, Debbie says, the way I understand it, oh yeah, she was answering the garlic lady. Yeah, it's got to be fresh. Got to be fresh. Uh, Shay Anders Hensley, Shea Hensley wants to know, does aspirin substitutes also thin your blood? Yeah, yeah, they do. So the, the spirea and the willow bark and the aspen and the poplar, all those guys, they're aspirin. They're basically aspirin. So, yeah, they'll thin your blood, and you need to be aware of that with other medications and stuff. Um all right, Donna Schott says, I'm in the East and there's no gumweed here and I can't find it in herb stores. Help. Well, rats, you need to move out here, Donna, into God's country where we got gumweed. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure it doesn't grow in the East. I'm pretty sure it grows everywhere, but uh, you're probably looking in places where the dirt's too nice. I'm guessing that's the trouble. <laughs> uh, we have it. Go to homegrownherbalist.net and click on single herb tinctures or just do a search for gumweed and we'll sell you all the gumweed tincture you want um otherwise yeah it's usually called grindelia if you can't find it in the herb stores under gumweed uh it's because they ain't from idaho and they're calling it grindelia g-r-i-n-d-e-l-i-a that's what they usually call it in the trade you may have better luck finding it that way but if you do a search at homegrownherbalist.net we certainly have it so uh all right, and again, all the tinctures, all the respiratory tinctures on the site right now are 20% off. Just use the discount code RESPIRATORY. We'll give you 20% off of those rascals. And uh, that uh, respiratory preparedness kit is like 35% off, I think. They, they discounted that one a lot, too, for this. And, of course, if you put webinar in there, you can get 100 bucks off the school. So go over there and get some big discounts this week. Uh, Mary says, my husband was an active volunteer fireman th for 35 years, was caught in a fire and scorched his trachea, and had a chronic cough, and mullein was his go-to for relief. Yeah, that's a fabulous herb. Um, you know, I've even known people like with cystic fibrosis that use mullein and really get good relief. It's a wonderful, wonderful, calming, cough suppressant. It's a pretty good expectorant. Just a great plant. Um... 
Um, Mary says, if I didn't enroll in, oh yeah, and so she continues, if I hadn't enrolled in your course, I might not have ever learned about the benefits of that wonderful plant. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary. We're, we're so glad to be of help and uh, so glad that God made that mullen. That was really nice of him. Uh, mullen is a great plant. Okay. All right, I'm scrolling up now. Okay, whoops, now I scrolled up too far. This whole scrolling thing, you got to be pretty smart. All right. Okay. Um, yes, Stacy says a week is so much more preferable to seven days. I think so. I think so. I'd rather do one week than seven days on that Lomation Rash. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Chris wants to know if there's inulin in garlic, too. Yeah, you bet. There's inulin in burdock. There's inulin in all kinds of... Those root vegetables, a lot of those root herbs have a lot of inulin in them. So you bet. Uh, Country City says, say no to drugs. That might not be bad advice. Um, okay. Susan says, how do you diagnose difficulty breathing that's not seasonal or from an obvious illness? So I, I don't know. Um I'll tell you, as far as diagnosing, uh, herbalists aren't legally diagnosticians. So one of the really smart thing is to go to the doctor and have Tim tell you what's wrong with you and then go to the herbalist and have him help you fix it. That's uh, <laughs> that's my advice. Um, some of those respiratory things that are chronic and weird, it's kind of hard to tell what they are without some uh, you know, diagnostic imaging and some other things that we don't usually have access to as herbalists. Um, all right. Archer's friend wants to know, what's the name of the second plant source we mentioned earlier? Companionplants.com and uh, strictlymedicinalseeds.com. Those are the guys. Uh, Susan's, or no, who Reva says, should you take the bark off the arrow leaf balsam root? I never do. I just, I mean, I guess you could. I just slice it up with a bandsaw and, and that's how we do it. Um, but I guess if you wanted to chip through the bark and try to get to the soft inner root that that'd be good too there's probably that's where most of the medicine is but that's not how we've done it historically all right more scrolling here debbie delaney says any reason to use yarrow root instead of the flowers absolutely you should use the root if you want it not to do the things that the flower does that's when i use it um, but, uh, <laughs> the root's different. The root's medicinal, but it's different. The root of yarrow is, is actually good for, uh, topically for a bad tooth. It numbs, numbs you up like lidocaine or novocaine. Um, but I don't know, it might have the, I don't know if it has the bleeding properties and the diaphragmatic properties or not. I've never tried it for that, but I'll tell you what, my wife had a really bad, uh, something awful done. I don't remember if it was a root canal or they did something bad to one of her teeth and she was in horrible pain. And, uh, you know, some of those plants are really good. We used cloves on her. Cloves work for that, too. But you can use yarrow root, and that's a good number. Um, Antoinette says, how far off the road would you suggest to harvest? So, you know, it kind of depends. Uh, I mean, if it's a country road and some farmer's driving down it twice a day, I don't care. I'll harvest next to that road. But if it's a freeway, I'm going to want to be, you know, quite a ways from that. So it just depends how busy it is. Okay, Chris wants to know, are you going to make a PDF like before? I sure am. You bet. Send me an email with PDF in the subject line, and we'll send you the PDF. Um, Susan O'Connor asks, she says, Herb Farm is discontinuing their Pau de Arco tincture. What should I take instead? Uh, so what I would take instead is the homegrownherbalist.net Pau de Arco tincture. That's what I would take instead. Just go to homegrownherbalist.net and buy it from us. We're lovely people, and we've got it in a bottle and everything, so we're very fancy. Uh, just go to the single herb tinctures. We've got about 150 different herbs uh, available as single tinctures, single herb tinctures. So if you need Pau de Arco or something weird, we've probably got it. A lot of those things we're growing ourselves, not the Pau de Arco, obviously. Uh, although I do plan someday to have a farm in Brazil and, and uh, do my herb growing there. That would be more fun than growing them in Idaho. But, uh, yeah, you can get Pau de Arco from us. Laura wants to know, will Wi-Fi damage the potency or medicinal properties of herbs that are stored within several feet of it? 
I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Evan, you need to research that. Is Wi-Fi making us all brain dead and killing our herbs? I don't know. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, Dia says, I used to use nettle for ragweed. I have since been put on warfarin as a blood thinner and have stopped the nettle because of the vitamin K. Can you suggest, scrolling down, a course of action to battle ragweed season? Yeah, try the Brigham tea. Try the Brigham tea. That's a good, uh, that's a good antihistamine. The other thing you can do is you can take herbs. The other way you can get rid of histamines is uh, to take herbs that stimulate your liver, right? Because your liver is the organ that eliminates histamines. So, you know, you can take Brigham tea to stop the histamines directly, and you can take burdock or something to make your liver happy and eliminate them faster. Okay, let's see. Um, do you use the flower on the black-eyed Susans like echinacea? Absolutely. Yeah, you bet. That's what I like. I like the flower. You can use the roots, too, but the flowers are almost as good. And on the black-eyed Susan, I think they're every bit as good. Uh, so I use echinacea flower for almost everything except rattlesnake bites. If it's a rattlesnake bite, I'll use the root. Um, and that's a whole other lecture and a whole other thing. But uh, echinacea is fabulous for venomous bites. It, it stops the tissue destruction. Uh, in fact, that's what snake oil was. You know, when they talk about snake oil, it was echinacea root. So, yeah, it worked good. Um I can't get the webinar. It's been going to start for two hours. I bet you needed to refresh. We're going to put it on here on YouTube, and you'll be able to watch it whenever you want, Petty Pro. Don't worry about it. Um, Antoinette says, I was pulling weeds out of my yard, and I got a rash. I was having a reaction to one of them. Any suggestions how to treat it? Please and thank you. Uh, yeah, I would sure get some Brigham tea after that. That's a good antihistamine. Um of course, washing it off and, you know, burdock, too. I'd get some burdock internally. That would help. Um, that's no fun to be allergic to stuff. Can you please give us your email address, RM Donovan says. Absolutely. My email is info at homegrownherbalist.net. Or you can send it to doc at homegrownherbalist.net. Either way. Oh, look, Evan put that in there. He's clever. All right. Um... Barbara says, is there anything you'd recommend for fluid in the ears of a five-year-old? She also has a frequent cough. I'll tell you, the best thing in the world for earaches in little kids is onion juice. Uh, that's what I use. We raised 15 kids, and we used onion juice on all those little rascals. And so what you do is you take an onion, and you grind it up, and you strain it through a handkerchief, and then you put the little goober on a couch and you turn on a video of lion king or something fun and while he's watching the video you squirt the onion juice in his ear you have him lay there on his side for a minute and keep it in there and that's that's fantastic for earaches i've never had an earache i never had to do it twice on the same earache um it really works well you can make a, an infused oil out of mullen flowers too uh just fill a jar with mullen flowers and cover them with olive oil and two weeks you'll have an infused oil you can use that for earaches but the onion juice I mean, I've never done that with the mullen flowers because I never really saw the point of uh, doing something that took two weeks that I could do with something that took two minutes, you know. So I always just grind up an onion. Garlic works too. Onion and garlic are in the same genus. But I like the onion better because it's watery instead of oily. So you squirt it in, and then when they're done, it comes rolling out, and you're not all greasy in your ear. That's good. Um, and as far as the cough, I'd get a little mullen on a little bug like that. That would probably really help her. Um Stacy says, how would you take the gum weed in a tea or a tincture? So I don't, either way, it doesn't matter. You can make a tea uh, or you can make a tincture. Gum weed's pretty oily, pretty resinous. So I would probably do the tincture preferably on that. It's probably a little more effective, but uh, you could certainly do, um, you could certainly do a tea as well. Rhonda says, how do you fix restless leg syndrome? Um, well, I don't know how you fix it, but I know a way to help you get through the night and not kick so much. We have a formula called uh, rested leg uh, on the website, which is actually coincidentally helps your legs rest. Not that we're making any claims, of course, but uh, yeah, try that. Um, 
Speaking of garlic, have you ever heard not to give garlic to dogs in any form? I read that. It does something to their white blood cells. R.M. Donovan asks. That is true. Uh, garlic and onions both, uh, they don't do something to their white blood cells. They suppress their bone marrow is what they do. You can get an anemia uh, and a lymphopenia. You get white and red blood cell decreases because it's suppressing the bone marrow. I use garlic in dogs all the time, but I don't use very much. I'm careful with it. Um, but it's not like toxic and deadly or anything, but you just don't overdo it with them. Um, there's a couple other herbs you shouldn't use in dogs. You shouldn't use uh, uh, hops. I mean, you can use it. And I use hops in dogs too, but I'm careful with it. Um, also, grapes, raisins are very toxic to dogs. So be careful with that. Um, let's see. Dorothea says, our cat was sneezing for days and I made mullein tea and put it in a diffuser near her and she stopped sneezing within two days. There you go. Good work, Dorothea. Cats are hard to get herbs into, really hard. And I'll tell you, uh, if I can say something about diffusers, a tea in a diffuser is great. That's, I don't have a problem with that. But I do have a problem. A lot of people are starting to use these diffusers for essential oils. And from a veterinary standpoint, that's a little bit of a train wreck sometimes. Uh, dogs and cats have very different livers than humans have. And sometimes they turn those essential oils into things that we don't turn them into, and they're very toxic. And we're actually starting to see some dead dogs in this country from uh, essential oil diffusers. So be careful. Um, okay, RM says, yeah, it's toxic and damages red cells in dogs. Yeah, it's the bone marrow. It damages the cells and inhibits the bone marrow from producing more cells. So yeah, just be careful with the garlic and onions in dogs. Um, Barbara says, I've had a 20-year-long congestive cough. Holy cow, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I would, you know, I hope you've tried some mullen and, and some gumweed and elecampane. Try some of the things we talked about here tonight and see if that helps you. Um, Susan says, how do you get colonized mold out of the body? Uh, well, you know, first of all, I would I would do some expectorant herbs to clean your lungs out. Um and then I would try and get, you know, there's a lot of antifungal herbs. We have a formula uh, called Candida on the website uh, that has some good antifungal herbs in it that you might have, have a look at that. <clears throat> um, Mary says, sorry to hear about Carl the Herb Hound. Yeah, we were sorry. We went on vacation and the old coot kicked the bucket. We were very sad about it. He's just the best dog in the whole world. And Ozzy, his apprentice, is uh, still very much a work in progress. <laughs> but he but he has stopped chewing everything, almost. He's about a year old now. Uh, he's a, one of those doodle dogs. He's he's a standard poodle. His dad was a standard poodle. And then his mom was Golden Retriever and Springer Spaniel. So, so you've got the intelligence of the standard poodle, the boundless energy of the Golden Retriever, and the complete disregard for authority of the Springer Spaniel. So it's really... The perfect breed for the man who wants everything in a dog, right? But uh, anyway, <laughs> he's a nice kid. Uh, but yeah, he's coming around. Okay, let's see. Um, Dorothy says, Brigham looks just like horsetail with all those little branches. It is the same stuff. It grows by the river in Montana here. No, no, no. Wrong thing. Completely different. Horsetail, uh, equisetum, or shave grass, they call it or scouring rush, they call it. If you look at that plant, it's always near the water, right? And it's just a grass. You know, it comes up as a grass, and the tubes are hollow. If you squeeze them, they're hollow. Uh, and it does look sort of superficially like Brigham tea, but Brigham tea is made out of wood. You know, those, those little guys are twigs. And Brigham tea doesn't grow near the water. It grows up in the high desert uh, in southern Utah. Um, you'll never see horsetail growing next to Brigham tea unless there's an irrigation ditch there or something, I guess. Um, no, completely different. Horsetail is a kidney herb. Uh, it's also got a lot of silica for your bones and your teeth, but yeah, no, it's a different critter. I get that question a lot. Okay. What can someone take for stuffy ears? Buster says, uh, I would try some cayenne. Try and clear your head out with that. Barbara says, thanks. I say you're welcome. Um, Chris says, thanks for the info on the garlic for dogs. I've fed garlic to my dogs and cats for years. No fleas or ticks. Yeah. You just have to be careful with it. 
it's not uh, it's not highly toxic, but be careful with it. I'll tell you something else. Uh, is xylitol the the sweetener? You know uh, that they put in everything, peanut butter and all those things. That's pretty toxic to dogs. So so make sure you don't have any of that. Um, RM says thanks for taking the time to talk with us and thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, I appreciate it very much. So uh, looks like that's all the questions. Um, if you have more questions, just put them in the comments there. And I'll keep answering them. I don't care. Uh, we'll just keep puttering along here indefinitely. That's what YouTube's good for. So uh, again, thanks for listening. Doc Jones here from the Homegrown Herbalist School. Just uh, one more last reminder that all the respiratory herbs are on sale right now. Homegrownherbalist.net. Use the discount code RESPIRATORY. And we'll give you 20% off. And uh, also there's, I think it's like 35% off on those respiratory preparedness kits. Uh, so grab one of those too. Then you're ready to hit the ground running when flu season gets here. And uh, if you haven't taken occasion, come to that respiratory masters thing. We'll be doing one of those probably in a city near you at some point. Get on the, get on the website and uh, go to events and see when we're doing one of those close to you. I'm doing one here in Buell this week on Saturday. And if you live in Timbuktu or Australia or South Africa or somewhere, uh, sign up for the school and you'll still have access to all that stuff. We, uh, I've got students in Australia and Europe and South Africa and Central America and all over the place. Even like Tennessee, really exotic, crazy places. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we don't care if you're in Idaho. You'll still be able to do all the things you need to do and we'll teach you wonderful things and you'll have a lot of fun. You'll have access to everything for life if you join the school. And again, you get a study buddy for free because uh, I think you'll learn it better if you got somebody to learn it with. And uh, if you use the discount code WEBINAR here for a little while, we'll give you 100 bucks off. So that's a screaming deal. A lot of these schools are $5,000. And I guarantee you they're not teaching stuff at the depth we're teaching it. Um, and I'm not running them down. They're nice people. But the fact is I have a different perspective because uh, of the veterinary practice and the doctor school and the being a practicing naturopath and clinical herbalist for all these years. I, I see a lot of stuff and do a lot of stuff with herbs, uh, especially in the veterinary practice that a lot of herbalists just aren't able to do. So, you know, if you want to learn about gunshot wounds and rattlesnake bites and sepsis and, you know, kidney failure and all that stuff, you know, come come learn from somebody that does that stuff all day. Homegrownherbalist.net, Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones, and thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.